states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction. Sadaqallahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. A bit of history, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam as it is known, was born on the 15th, or based on some narrations, in the middle of the holy month of Ramadan. It is widely known that he was born on the second year after Hijrah. However, according to Shaykh al-Mufid, he was born third year after Hijrah. Imam al-Hasan salam was known for his courage, for his bravery, and for his wisdom in the time that he lived. And I wanted to mention very quickly one of the beautiful merits of Imam al-Hasan before I dive into the speech tonight, inshallah ta'ala. When the Imam salam was born, Lady Fatima alayhi salam held him. And she placed him in a cloth made out of silk. And this was the same cloth that Prophet Muhammad received from Jibra'il from the heavens. So then Lady Fatima wraps Imam al Hassan salam in this same cloth and she gives him to the Holy Messenger. And she says to him, O oh, Rasulullah. I have just given birth to this child, so bless him for me. So the narration says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam held Imam al-Hasan in his blessed hands and he began to recite in the ease of Imam al-Hasan the shahada. And then he says this Hasan, this child is going to be a child that is filled with blessings. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam sacrifices a sheep in the name of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. That's from within the merit of the Imam alayhi salam. Now in relation to tonight's topic, my brothers and sisters, I want to quickly address one misconception that we hear. Why is it that al-Hasan ibn Ali, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam gave Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan, the leadership in his time. Now we all believe that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, are the rightly guided individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent onto this earth for everyone to be guided through their path and through the paths of the Prophets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's salutations be upon them all. But why is it that Imam al Hassan gave it to Muawiyah? And we all believe that an Imam will not do something that is contrary or contradicts the Holy Quran. And if the Imams are the rightly guided people, then why is it that they gave it to someone that was misguided? And is it possible that the Imams, alayhum as salam, will give the leadership to a misguided person and the people will then be misguided under their ruling or not? From the start, this misconception sounds very, very beautiful. Very easily we can hold the Shia accountable for something like this. However, when we go to the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, where they teach us how to understand who they are, they teach us to understand the actions that they perform. In a reliable narration, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam was asked, O oh, son of Rasulullah, how is it that you gave Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan, the leadership when you were more deserving of it? And when Allah chose you as the vicegerent on earth, how is it that you gave it to someone that is far from that? So Imam al Hassan asks a question. He says, do you believe that I am the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? The man says, yes. Do you believe that I am the rightly guided one after my father Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says, yes. Do you believe that I am an imam? I am a leader. 
after my father Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says, yes. He says, did you hear the narration that my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, Al-Hasani wal-Husayn imama qama aw qa'da. Did you not hear my grandfather say that Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn, both of them are imams if they were to stand or if they were to sit. So Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam says, I have sat down from the leadership for one reason. In order for everyone to understand the misguidance and deviant path that Muawiyah intends to pay for the people. Number two, some historians have drawn the conclusion that Imam Al-Hasan Ali's companions were not ready to fight Muawiyah. And that's why when Imam Al-Hasan Alayhi Salam gives the leadership to Muawiyah, what did the people say to Imam Al-Hasan? When they would see him walk in al Medina? what would they say to him? As-salamu alayka ya muvilla al mu'mineen That peace be upon you, O humiliator to the believers. That's how they would address Imam Al-Hasan Alayhi Salam. As the humiliator. But they didn't understand that there was a greater image that they were ignorant of. So then, Muawiyah takes rule. Imam al Hassan says to him in his khutbah, he gives a letter to Muawiyah. He says, oh Muawiyah, I will give you the leadership, but you will be subject to certain rulings. The first one is, if you die, the ruling goes back to me if I'm alive. And if I'm not alive, to who? To al Hussein alayhi salam. The second thing is, is that you stop the cursing of my father on the member. As we know in the time of Muawiyah, the cursing of Imam Ali alayhi salam was spread on the pulpits. And as we know, Friday prayer is performed on what day? Friday? Muawiyah changes it to what day? To a Wednesday. Salatul Jumu'ah is performed on a Wednesday. So Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam has very, very wise cards to play, if it's safe to say so. In order for the people to understand that we are with the truth, they need to understand how life will be under other than us. And there is a wisdom behind that. The wisdom is if you did not know how life was under them, and then when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt السلام, you say, why is it that no one else took rule? Even though this was a decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed, without a doubt. But this is also a message to the people that we are the rightly guided ones, no one else. So as we all know, Muawiyah grabs the letter that Imam al-Hasan gave him and he throws it on the ground. He says, I don't agree with any of the rulings that al-Hasan gave. So, historians say that Imam Al-Hasan was in Al-Kufa at the time. He goes up on the pulpit and he says, Oh people, I do not give allegiance. I do not pay allegiance to Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan. And he has forced me to give it to him. So he has taken it by force. Now, why didn't the Imam revolt? Because the Shia at the time were not ready. What did take place was Imam al Hassan paved way for Imam al Hussein. Why is it that when everything took place, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says, when he speaks to the likes of Yazid, why does he say, la that someone like me does not pay allegiance to someone like Yazid? If they were rightly guided people, then why did al Hussein say this? Imam al Hassan exposed them from day one. He paved way for them to be exposed. And that's why when Muawiyah did the things that he did, one of the most beautiful stories is that one day Amir al Mu'mineen went to go fight Muawiyah. So Muawiyah had like a little devil in his ear by the name of Amr ibn al As. 
He was Muawiyah's devil in the E. He would whisper to Muawiyah in the E. So Amr ibn al-As says to him, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, O oh, Muawiyah, Ali ibn Abi Talib is right there. And who is Ali compared to you? You are stronger, you are far greater. So Amr ibn al-As tries to convince Muawiyah, O oh, oh, Muawiyah, go out and fight Ali. In the battlefield, easily you will win. Muawiyah thought, this is something that's bigger than me. This is higher than my pay grade. So then he turns around. He says, O oh, Amr ibn al-As, if your tongue is worth anything, if you have any dignity, why don't you yourself go out and fight Ali ibn Abi Talib? So now Amr ibn al-As was put in a, tough, in a tough position. So he goes out. Amr ibn al-As goes out to fight Imam Ali in the battlefield. Amr ibn al-As began to walk and Amir al-Mu'mineen jumped on his horse. Amir al-Mu'mineen is riding towards Amr ibn al-As, the man who would open his mouth as if he was the strongest man alive. He's seen Ali ibn Abi Talib run at him. Narration say he lifted a bit of his skin which is haram for one to look at and Imam Ali turned around. The way that he got out of being killed is that he had to lift his awrah up so Imam Ali doesn't kill him. What type of man is that? These are the, this is the mentality that the Ahlul Bayt fought. So that's why Imam al Hussein says, someone like me doesn't pay allegiance to someone like Yazid. Yazid is a man that kills the innocent soul. Yazid is the man that drinks alcohol willingly in front of people. And then Imam al Hussein very nicely says, Yazid is a man that plays with monkeys. You want someone that plays with monkeys to guide the Muslim Ummah? Nonetheless, my brothers and my sisters, the ayah that I mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Al Nahl, ayah number 125, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and call to the path of Allah through wisdom and good instructions. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Inshallah, very quickly with the time that I have remaining and without wasting your precious time. One of the questions that I was asked is how is it that we can maintain our religion in the society that we live in today? And that's a good question because we need to understand how do I as a Shia, as a Muslim, as a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala live in a time that my identity is in a crisis. Okay. Number one. In order for us to understand what is required, as we mentioned previously, and I don't want to go back through the same narrations, we were sent prophets to be guided. One, two, and three, that's been established. We've established this for the past few nights. We have prophets and imams to guide us. Number two. How do we guide the society that we live in? Because everyone that is present on this night tonight is here for a reason. You are unlike everyone else in the community. You all have come here to gain something, to benefit from Islam in some way. Which means that you want, in a way, to reform the society that you live in. Number one, how do I spread the message of Islam in the West? If we go back to the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Call to my path through wisdom and good instructions. Number one, I need to have wisdom. If I want to go out into a society that doesn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before I can even say to them that there is a God, or before I can say to them that I am a Muslim, I need to dress in a way that shows I'm a Muslim. When I mean by dress, I don't mean the hijab. I leave that to other scholars to speak about. I don't speak about these, to these topics. I speak about the way that you conduct yourself. The way you dress is the way that you conduct yourself. In today's society, my brothers and my sisters, a non-Muslim's first exposure to Islam is you. A non-Muslim's first exposure to Islam is you. Is your actions. Is the way you look. Is the way you talk. Is the way you conduct yourself. 
And that's why when I say that everyone here has a role in changing the community, I say that because when everyone looks at you, they see Islam. Even if your name is Ali and you go, for example, to places that are inappropriate. Either your name is Muhammad and you go to places that are inappropriate. Either your name is Zainab and you say things that are inappropriate at work, in your workplace, on social media, etc., etc. In the end, you are the first, potentially, the first exposure that a non-Muslim has to Islam. This is how Islam encourages their people to act. When they speak like this, the non-Muslim doesn't know what Islam says. But they see your actions. And if you are as a Muslim have not been affected by what Islam says, they say, if the Muslim hasn't been affected, how am I going to be affected? And this comes up to something that I heard the other day. One day, there was someone who was an Aussie with a strong Aussie accent. He owns a company. He's a Muslim, alhamdulillah. He owns a company. Someone calls him. He's also a Muslim that calls him. He says to him, brother, I'm looking for work. He says to him, okay. What's your name? My name is 123. It was a Muslim name. He says, okay. I want to ask you a question. So the owner of the company asks the Muslim guy that called him a question. But the guy that, know, the guy that called him doesn't know that the one he called, the owner, is Muslim. He sounds like a redneck, as they say. Full-blown Aussie. He says to him, I want a job. He says, okay, your name is 123. Okay, I want to ask you a question. You Muslims, I heard that you have something called Friday prayer. He says, yes. I heard that it's important for you Muslims to attend Friday prayer. The guy that called buckled. What do I say? I want to get a job. I can't take Fridays off. How am I going to get a job? He says, yeah, we have something called Friday prayer. But, you know, this isn't something that I have to attend to. It's only up to me. If I want to go, I can go. And some scholars have said that if I work, I don't have to go to Friday prayer. So the Muslim owner of the company was shocked. So he says to him, Assalamu alaikum, brother. So the other guy, the Muslim that called him was shocked. What's this guy saying? He says, I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. So he was shocked that his accent, one, two, and three, anyways, cut the, the story short. He says, listen, I can't give you the job. Because why? Your resume, everything was good. But you were willing to give up your God and your religion and your prayer for a job? If you are willing to give your religion up for a job, I'm not willing to lose my job for someone like you. If you cannot put your religion first and you put everything before your religion, in the end, you end up losing. No one else. So the first way, my brothers and my sisters, to call to the path of Islam is through my actions and the way that I invite people. Now, we all heard, actions speak louder than words. Your actions are louder than the words that you speak. And this is an example Imam Ali السلام, has in his letter to Malik al-Ashtar when he sent him to, gov to govern a certain area. If I'm not mistaken, it's khutbah number 51 or 52 in Nahj al -Balagha. He says, Malik, you know if you want to go to the people, you want to listen to them. Listen to everything they say to you. He says, O Malik, don't let your pride overpower you when you see that you are wealthy and rich and you see everyone else as poor. He says, beware, O Malik, I'm not sending you for you to boast. When you go to your people to govern them, you need to make a certain portion of your time free for the low income people in your community. He says, Malik, when you do that, you are not to take any of your guards or your police members with you to protect you. Why does Imam Ali say such a thing to a governor? Because the governor's role, someone with a high status, their role is to listen to everyone else. Their role is to accompany the people with what they need, help them, do whatever they want. How can you call to Islam when you don't help the people? And that's what Imam Ali was saying, that if you are in a higher position than someone else, 
then you need to help them. You need to extend your hand out to them. And then he says, O oh Malik, beware. Don't oppress the one that has no one to aid him but Allah. For I heard my grandfather Rasulullah say that if anyone oppresses someone that has no one to help them but Allah, then Allah will send his wrath upon the people. This is what you call leadership. Someone like Imam Ali, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, teaches us how to conduct ourselves with everyone else, how to speak with everyone else. And that's why in the same khutbah, in the same letter, he says that in humanity, your brothers are of two kinds. One, either they are from the same religion that you come from, or two, they're from the same humanity that you come from. No one is higher than you. Everyone needs to be helped equally. So Islam says that the first way that you can call to Islam is through your actions, through your wisdom. Here comes the question. What if the society that I live in is very stubborn to the extent that I can't even speak to them about anything? I can't say to them, this is halal or haram. I can barely say to them that we have something called prayer. How do I? Start working in a society like this. Number one. You need to be the greatest example to the people. We established that in the first point that I met. Number two. One day Imam Al-Hasan and Imam al Hussein see an old man performing wudu. So they turn around to each other. Oh brother, the man that is performing wudu is performing his wudu wrong. What do we do? Let's tell him that his wudu is wrong. So then the other imam turns to his brother. He says, It's a bit tough to go tell someone that is old that your actions are incorrect. Especially someone that is young saying to an older person that your actions are incorrect. It's a bit hard for the old person to give in to that. So he says, Let's use another tactic. Okay. Why don't we go and tell him that me, for example, I, al Hussein, and my brother Hassan want to perform wudu together. Can you tell us whose wudu is better? My brother Hassan or me, al Hussein? So they say, they said, oh old man, can you tell us, can you watch us, observe us, whose wudu is more correct? So he says, okay, al Hassan does his wudu, and then al Hussein does his wudu. So then the old man comes and says, Oh my masters, it is not your wudu that is incorrect, it's my wudu that's incorrect. See the wisdom that the Imam had? He changed an entire man's life through him speaking with his brother Hassan and the old man watching. The same way when us Muslims communicate with each other. If us Muslims are constantly fighting each other and backbiting each other and slandering each other. How do you think the Westerner is going to observe this? They're going to say that if the Muslims couldn't benefit, what are we going to benefit? So our actions are very important, especially if we want to go out into the community and into the society and try to change them as much as we can. Number two. Point number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on my very, very fast research, I have deducted from this one verse key points that everyone needs to have in themselves in order for them to call to Islam. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, and who is better in speech than he who says my Lord is Allah. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best person that speaks or the person that utters this one word is the best of creation that is utilizing their mouth. The first thing to say is, La ilaha illallah. I believe that Allah is the only Lord and there is no other Lord with Allah. And then Allah Ta'ala continues in the same verse. He says, and then he stands firm. I'm not going to explain the stands firm because I mentioned that a few weeks ago at this blessed place. And then Allah says, and then he invites to the way of Allah and does righteous deeds. Then he says, I am Muslim. You invite to the way of Allah. 
you do righteous deeds in front of the people that see you. In your workplaces, my brothers and sisters, those that work, it's going to be a bit embarrassing. That's normal. It's going to be a bit, you know, as some people might say, cringe. It's okay. As much as you can, try to hold on to your religion in your workplace. You might say, but what if they discriminate? They won't discriminate. They can't discriminate. It's against the law to discriminate, as they say. But number two, some people don't actually know what Islam is. I personally, I'd rather be humiliated for five minutes while people watching me pray and in the end they come and they ask me, what are you doing? Then me being a Muslim and no one understanding Islam because they see my actions. I remember I was at a place and I was praying. I'll tell you the truth, all of us, when we pray in public, we get a bit nervous. That's normal. That's normal, my brothers and sisters. In the society that we live in, it's a bit tough. But we need to build ourselves so that we lift our heads up that we are Muslim. Of course, don't go to areas that are unsafe and then you want to go and practice Islam over there. It's a bit tough. Try within the community that you live. First of all, try in your workplace, for example. I was, I was praying somewhere and someone came up to me and asked me, what were you doing? I said, I'm a Muslim and I have to pray. It's from within the obligation of me as a Muslim that I have to stop my entire life when it comes to praying, this person was surprised that there are those that still exist in an era like today that everyone has sold not only themselves, their religions, that someone is still praying. So it's about the way that you conduct yourself, the way that you act. So Allah says, the best way to invite to my path, one, to say, La ilaha illallah, two, to do right, and to affirm your religion, and number three is to do righteous deeds, then say that I am a Muslim, so that people can know. One day, someone came up to Imam al-Sadiq when he was in al Medina. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this previously. They said to him, Oh Master, we hear that everyone is saying that we are Ja'fari, we are Ja'fari in the community that we live in. As we all know, Imam al-Sadiq had over how many students? 4,000 students. One of the scholars from our brethren from the other sect studied under Imam al-Sadiq for a period of two years. And he says, That if it wasn't for these two years that I studied under Imam al-Sadiq, then I would have perished. This is one of the four scholars that our brethren from the other sect believe in. So he says, oh my master, everyone is saying that this man is a student of Imam al-Sadiq. This man is a student of Imam al-Sadiq. So Imam al-Sadiq became shocked. He says, إِنَّمَا أَصْحَابُ جَعْفَرْ مِنْكُمْ لَقَلِيلٌ That the companions of Ja'far al-Sadiq amongst our community is very minimal. Probably count them on my hand. Then he says, that the companions of Imam al-Sadiq are those that are pious. Those that refrain from situations where they are unsure about things. He says those are the companions of Imam al-Sadiq. Not everyone that says that they are the companions of Imam al-Sadiq or the followers of Imam al-Sadiq are truly companions in their eyes. You know, sometimes some of us say that we are Shia. You know, for us to be a Shia, we need to be in the level of Salman, Miqdad, Abu Dhar. These are Shia. We can probably call ourselves lovers to the Shia. Lovers to the companions of the Ahlul Bayt, However, we have some narrations that say that those in the end of time, that live in the end of time and hold on to their religion, in the end of time, are better than the companions of Rasulullah. I have narrations. That's how important the Ahlul Bayt say holding on to your religion is. I will quickly mention because the time is very, very short. There is one hadith that Imam al Sadiq, Afwan, there is one hadith that Imam al Hassan alayhi salam gives to his companion Jun, uh, Junad. One day, Imam al Hassan was on his deathbed before he passed away into the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
A companion by the name of Junada enters upon Imam al Hassan. Imam al Hassan is in a state where he is suffering from poison. They say that he is vomiting his liver out. That's how dangerous and how strong the poison was. He was poisoned by his wife. So Junana says, my master, I know that you're on the deathbed, but I want advice. I want advice from you. So then Imam al Hassan says to him, Ya Junada, istahadda li safarik. Oh Junada, prepare for your travel. The same way when we want to prepare to go overseas, we prepare our luggage, our suitcase, what am I going to wear? Five, six different change of clothes. I don't want to wear this, I want to wear this, one, two, and three. We prepare ourselves. That's normal. But Imam al-Sad, Imam al Hassan says, O oh, Junada, prepare your luggage. And go and gather your income. What is meant by Zad is your actions, your good deeds. So he says to him, O oh, Junada, prepare for your travel and get a hold of your good deeds and your good doings. Your luggage in the afterlife, my brothers and sisters, are your good deeds and your good actions. And then Imam al-Hassan says, and understand that while you ask for this worldly life, death asks for you. While we are busy building, doing whatever, trying to prepare for this long life, I want to retire when I'm 40, I want to be financially free. While we work towards this, Imam al-Hassan says that death is asking for you. And do not stress about tomorrow while you are living in the present day. Don't stress about tomorrow. What am, what am I going to eat tomorrow? I have no food tomorrow. I need to pay the bills tomorrow. Imam al-Hassan says, live today. And when tomorrow comes, worry about tomorrow. And do for your worldly life as if you will reside in it forever. Build your dunya. No one said don't build your dunya. Build this worldly life as if you will live forever. But then the catch comes. And prepare for your afterlife as if you die tomorrow. While I am building this worldly life, I am also building my afterlife at the same time together I don't let go of my afterlife for my dunya or, or I don't forget my dunya for my afterlife no you get both and you try to hold on to both in summary my brothers and sisters inshallah from Saturday night I will be here for a period of five nights inshallah for the martyrdom of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam but very importantly, my brothers and sisters, try to do muraqaba. Muraqaba when it comes to Arfan and all of these type of things is that I look at myself. I constantly keep an eye on myself. What am I doing? What am I saying? Imam al kadhim says that you are not from within our Shia if you don't hold yourself accountable every night. What did I do today? What did I say today? How can I better myself? I made a mistake. I repent from my mistake. As long as my actions, I am aware of it and I change it. Right? I know I was driving somewhere once and someone was driving very slow in front of me. And I needed to get somewhere very fast. So I, I beeped at the guy. I beeped. Like a, a good generous beep. Right? And then I got told off, someone was sitting next to me and they said to me, don't do that. You are supposed to represent Islam. You are supposed to be someone that calls to Islam. What if that person that came out and wanted to perform road rage and seeing you as a Muslim, how, what image is this person going to build? I'm not infallible. I commit mistakes. I do sins. But I learned my lesson from that. But in the end, we all call to Islam. We all call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why, as they say in primary school, you need to be on your best behavior, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. And may Allah bless your lives individually. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your fasts. And inshallah, there is not much left. 15 days. 15 came, 15 went.
time goes very fast. So may Allah bless you, inshallah. Allahumma ajjil liwaliyyika al-faraj wa alayna biridah. Wa hab lana rafatahu wa rahmatahu wa dua'a. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salam. Just quickly, I'm not going to ask if there's any questions because no one seems to put their hand up when I ask. 